Jacqueline DePaul, founder of Yellow Brick One Way. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. So tell us a little bit about that concept before we dig deeper into you. Yellow Brick Runway? Yeah. That's my blog. It's a fashion collaboration blog. And I partner with different fashion artists, so designers, hair, makeup, stylists, jewelry. And we create fashion concepts using me as a model, which a lot of them are considered maybe inappropriate for a 45-year-old model, not from a skin perspective, but mm -hmm. we did one called The Anguished Bride, where this, it was very, all bridal gowns, and, and it was very, like, anguished, you know? We're like, uh -huh. what's this lady's story? <laughs> she got left at the altar, she's dead, she's mm -hmm. haunting her husband, whatever. <laughs> well, what, she's what? being chased by the mafia. But that's inappropriate because of well, 45. Well, no, because maturity is taboo in fashion. Right, Let's be honest. Right, okay. And that's one of the reasons why you wrote into the show. Right. It is. It is. That's okay. correct. Okay. Being 48 and fabulous, why is that? I mean, why is 45? You can't do that. Well, I, I was told by my industry representatives, we love the hair, we love the makeup, we love the expression, but you can't use these pictures. Why not? Because you're wearing a wedding gown, and the problem is. Well, mm -hmm. you're too old to wear a wedding gown. I go, well, what am I supposed to get married in? You know, I, I, wow. I, I don't know, you know, so, but it, it's funny to um, me. But actually, so. I, do, I do connect with that in yeah. a way because I'm married, divorced, mm -hmm. and maybe marriage might be in the future, but, you know, I have a really hard time visualizing myself in a wedding gown. Is that, so do you feel age. like you're not re represented yeah. as mature women? Yes. Well, in, in the fashion industry, if you look at it, you know, everybody kind of looks like you. And, oh, maybe, and younger. And maybe, maybe <laughs> okay. 14, and right? Yeah. And, and they're 16, and, and that's great. You know, it, it, we live in the United States. Everyone can represent their brand the way they want to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. But there are women, you know, I'm 45, so I'm, you know, after 35, I think in our culture, we age out of glamour. No longer are we advertised beautiful dresses right. and makeup and That's whatever. True. Our You're advertised advertises wrinkle creams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. wrinkle <laughs> cream, but Depends. appliances, yeah. dependable cars, you know, Swiffers. Mm -hmm. yep. And and our big achievement in advertising, like you know, if we're advertising, our big achievement is that we managed to get the soccer uniform mm -hmm. clean well, for the child. <laughs> but I think you identify with that in the sense right. that for a while before. Right. I was doing commercials, and I was doing. I was very successful at it. And mm. one of the things that, um, I, but I was successful at being a very conservative mom. Mm -hmm. Right. And make, but yes. what what possessed you then to move into this industry? Because you have an interesting story. You're an IT consultant by, by I trade. I am. I am an IT consultant, and I was, you know, I I've never done fashion. I've always been tall. That's what I had. Okay. And people would say, "Are you a model?" I'm like, "No. How, how would I do that?" You know, I just never grew up in that environment. So at 38, my creative outlet was ballroom dancing and okay. salsa dancing. And mm -hmm. I injured myself, and I no longer had a way to express myself creatively, and I was very sad, because my job's very intellectual, but I needed a new way. And for some reason, I came up with this idea, I think I'm gonna start modeling, mm -hmm. which was kind of weird at 38. Good but, for you. But, oh, but I said, look, I'm not trying to be Giselle Bunchen. I'm just going to do it for myself, for the experience. But that way, <laughs> I have to applaud you because there's so many women out there who are kind of like stuck in a rut. And I'm not saying you're stuck in a rut, but I was stuck they in don't a rut. see people who look like them in the mm -hmm. magazines. I was sharing Correct. you guys, I wrote an article to an editor to say, in your home magazine, I saw one advertisement that related to mature women. It's correct. So for you to pick up the gauntlet and say, hey, look, 
I'm going to go out there and promote women mm -hmm. that look like me. I want to applaud you and tell you thank you. That's inspiring <laughs> for me because, you know, as I, where I'm at right now, I was not this way 10 years ago because I felt like I was not relevant. So you're right. reinventing your relevance. Mm -hmm. Right. But I have that a question because I haven't, what type of stuff do you model? I mean, you talked about the wedding dress, but there has to be other things. It's not just wedding dresses. No, no. I do, on my blog, I do whatever I and my team want to do. So mm -hmm. if we decide we want to do our own H&M campaign, we do it. Oh, yeah. I see. Well, 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 okay. It's really important to me, and I want to make sure we hit on this, is that it's beyond fashion. It's really about restarting yourself, right. yes. refinding your relevance at yeah. your age. Yeah. What was that journey like for you? Well, when I started the modeling, it was just for the experience. I was like, I'm tall, maybe I could pretend that I'm younger or whatever. <laughs> and I went and I volunteered at the community photography school for adults way out in West but Covina. But were you nervous? Oh yeah. And I looked like a female Zoolander trying to take those pictures. <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. I was all sexy well, and like, we're gonna here's me. <laughs> we're going to follow up more with Jacqueline. We'd love to invite you back to this show here on Every Way Woman. Stay tuned. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Are you in every way woman? Are you in every way woman? Welcome back to Every Way Woman. So we celebrate the trailblazers, and today we welcome Robin to the show, a woman who has truly perfected the art of redefining herself and restarting at any age. Welcome. So I really want to talk to you about what it was like to reinvent yourself. I think at the time you don't think about it, or you shouldn't think too closely about it. You just do what seems natural. You follow whatever path is sort of outlined for you without trying to take too much control. So let's rewind back to what your path was. Let's talk about the crossroads you were at in your life. Okay, I was a prison guard <laughs> in male Very. maximum security. You are a tough blonde. <laughs> which I am, a tough cookie. Um, which you find you don't want to do for the, your entire life, or, or I didn't. No, no, of course. And I thought it would be fun to write. So I was trying to think how I could get into advertising from prison guarding and it's not sort of one of those natural career paths. So I, I got a job at, with a temporary office service that sent people in when somebody was sick. So you worked your way through this transition, but were you yeah. scared? No, I wasn't, because at that time I was fairly young and I didn't think much about it. Okay. So I worked but for this service and I only went to advertising agencies and sort of got to know it gently, you know, by being at and the office. And this wasn't the first time you've restarted or reinvented. I mean, you fast forwarded a couple times, even as, even as a mother, your children grew out of the nest. Now you have to reinvent yourself, not as a mother, but as a woman again, as Robin. That's true. And that, that took a little more thought because you're used to being Jesse's mom or Robert's mom and suddenly you're Robin again. And um, you're, you're not quite sure how to do that anymore. <laughs> it's been a while. So I think the biggest thing is to talk to other women and to talk to everybody, really. And Talking, that's why you're here. And to talk to why I'm here. Okay. There's women here. <laughs> yes. And you know, other women are so smart and they always seem to know different things from you. And so you, you get to know, you know, you get But don't ideas. you feel like some women are afraid to ask? I think they are, and I think that's a mistake. Women love to talk, or any woman I know loves to talk. I and like to talk. I, I mean, like at the grocery too. store, wherever you are, at school, picking up your kids, if that's what you're doing, talk to the other women. Talk to everybody. At that time when you were um, transitioning your life and you said that you have to talk to other women, what was one thing that someone told you that still sticks with you today? Well, when I was um, finally got my green card down here, and I'd been out of advertising long enough that that wasn't going to work for me anymore, I, another woman at the school said, I think Americans hiring flight attendants. Why don't you try that? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and How I thought, old were you at this point, if you don't mind sharing? I was 45 when I started to be a flight attendant. And, and I wasn't the most oldest. people would consider that, you know, maybe even too late in life to restart a career. A little right. long in the tooth. But flight attendants aren't quite what 
we used to picture them, you know, when you were weighed every day and and you had to be single and um, all well, that kind of Well, you know, thing. it's really interesting, though, because at 45, you were willing to step into a position where it was off. It was adventure time. You weren't staying at it home was. anymore. You were all over the world. And that was part of it, that I think you have to look on life as an adventure. Every decision you make is an adventure. And I think you have to realize nothing is final. If I'd become a flight attendant and I loathed it, I would have quit and found something I like better. Because we're allowed to do that. We can, we can find what makes us happy. But not if we're afraid to make a jump ever. You know, I even find in my life, as I'm approaching you know, my later 20s. Oh I'm my god, your I later know, 20s. I know, I <laughs> know. But I'm, <laughs> afraid to, I'm almost afraid to make that choice or make that decision and say, you know what, maybe what I, the decision I made when I was in my younger 20s isn't going to work for me in my 30s. And being OK with that and settling with that, I almost feel like I'm letting myself down. There's very few decisions you can make that are going to be final. Where you can change your mind. You can right. go back and try something else. And I think that's the biggest lesson to learn. Don't be afraid of taking a jump into the unknown just because you're afraid that, that you're never going to be able to fix it if it's wrong. But were you afraid? Um, I don't think so, no. no? I, I don't think I was afraid. Nervous, maybe. Nervous, <laughs> yeah. That's fair. But yeah. Not, yeah. But not you afraid, make sense. afraid because you know, I have friends, I have a family. If it didn't work out, I would have to try something so, else, that's all. You know what, I have a question. I know someone who is in her 50s and she's very close to me. And you know, her kids are all done with school, they have jobs, they have their own families, they're out of the house. And it's this woman and, and her husband, but they're even having problems now within their marriage. And I think it's because, and tell me what your thoughts are on this, mm -hmm. I think it's because she is almost depressed about her life right now. She's in this bubble where She's like, what next? What now? Mm -hmm. My kids are gone. They have their own lives. Is my life over? Did you ever feel like that, or could you can I you relate didn't to that? Because I was working when mm -hmm. my kids left um, home, and and you know, but what would they you haven't say left to that woman? They're what still would you say very active in my life. I think uh, first of all, get a dog. Second yes. of all, maybe go back to school. Find something. Mm -hmm. Follow her passion. Don't look for something where you can make a lot of money or just something that'll make her happy. Mm -hmm. What am I interested in? Oh, I'm interested in art. I'll go to art school for a mm -hmm. while. You know, something like that. Just well, thank you for inspiring something. us and yes. inspiring all of you out there. We'll be right back with more Every White Woman. <laughs> we'll be back with Everyday Fitness. Are you in every way woman? Are you in every way woman? All right, don't go nowhere because after this break, Heather is going to be giving us some successful tips on how to be a personal trainer. There's more to personal training than telling your client one, two, three. So our fitness expert, Heather Benz, is here to tell us what it takes to be a successful personal trainer. Thanks, Heather. So well, how do you, you know, there's a lot of fit people out there. How do you know that you can take it to the next level and take a hobby into a business? Well, you have to have a love for it, a passion for it. If you don't love what you're doing and you don't have a passion for it, it's not going to work. So number one, that's the key. You just got to love it. So let's say you love working out, but how do you know that you can teach others to do it? I would say if you feel that you naturally have that personality and that gift and people naturally are, gravitate towards you when you're working out. That's one thing that happened to me. I'd be working out and people started coming up and asking me, can you show me how to do this? Can you show me how to do that? And it was like, hmm, little light bulb went on. And that's one of the things. If you feel that you don't have the issue of being in front of people and guiding them and tr having them trust you with their body, then you can go. So as far as like starting to get clients, was it just all word of mouth, people coming up to you? Or how, how do you find the right clients? Well, it, it would be great if people just started coming up and saying, Let, can you train me? But I no, need that to give doesn't you money. happen. I need to give you money. It doesn't happen that way. Basically, you have to first create your niche and figure out who do you want to work with? What kind of clientele? And then what is your philosophy? Because there's a ton of trainers out there, so you have to set yourself apart. And then once you figure that out, you have to actually go out and seek them. Well, and are there clients that you, you turn down because they don't fit what you need? Definitely. You Definitely. Turn down clients. I'm not the best trainer for every single person. 
Well, and especially there's so many fads out there. So do you have people coming to you for a certain fad and do you feel like the need to fit that niche? Uh, yes, sometimes I have individuals that come to me and they want to do Pilates or yoga and that's something I don't specialize in. Um, but if I have someone coming to me to lose body fat and build their endurance, for example, running marathons, chewing triathlons, or just even improving their body and building some muscle mass so they can stay healthy or correcting the physical imbalances in their body, reducing pain, then I can work with that. And do you help them with the whole body thing of like making sure they're eating right and all of that stuff? Definitely, you have to because a lot of it is the nutrition. A lot of it's what you put in your mouth. Now, let's talk about, you know, again with the business side of it because, you know, I mean, when you're building a relationship and working closely with a client, how do you make sure, like, let's say they're not coming on time or, or they're not paying? How do you make sure that you're still, you know, having a good client rapport but taking care of business? Well, if they're not paying, they're not your client. So the first thing is they're going to pay ahead of time. And then if they're not showing up, it's your responsibility to find out what motivates that client to get them to show up. But at some point, it is on them to show up. So it's finding that fine line. But the key of being a positive personal trainer, one that's successful in getting your clients to show up, is motivating them properly and making sure they're enjoying the workout and it's fun and that there's something they want to do. What about people who, you know, they, they want to get in shape, but they, like you're saying, they're not motivated to get there. Can you help them with the, the simple step of just getting there and being motivated? Definitely. Definitely. I mean, the hardest part for some of the people is just walking in and seeing you for that very first time. They're nervous. You're about to do a fitness assessment, and you're going to be learning about them and their body. And so the key is making them feel so comfortable and then making it sound exciting and that you're really going to help change their life, improve their health. And then before you know it, they actually find themselves wanting to. And you almost sell them, the idea, sell them on the idea of being healthy and happy and fit. And the other thing I wonder about something like this, because people are like, oh, no, I don't need to pay you. You can just show me how to do some push-ups. It, it's okay. You know, just show me how to do it. Like the doctors who are like, you know, I've got an elbow. Uh -huh. How do you know how much to value um, yourself? Um, well, I don't mind dropping a few tips here and there because, to be honest, you have to intrigue them, and they have to feel that you have the knowledge and the expertise of what they're going to do based on their goal so give them a little bit of information but then tease. put it into a tease and then have them come meet you and actually set up an appointment because in that appointment is where you'll take it to the next step do you feel like uh, you have to do a lot of like things like social media or you know like to keep putting yourself out there and yes nowadays especially because social media is so important and the key is never stop promoting yourself and never stop marketing and advertising and even if you have a full book of clients you never know anything can happen always keep promoting and have you ever run into clients who, you know, you've worked with for a long time, but then they do stop paying you, but they're like, you, you know I'm good for it. I mean, ha those are the hard ones, right? <laughs> yes, I actually have had that happen a couple times, and you build a trust relationship, and you do have clients that you've seen for years, and there is that trust and respect there. And then sometimes you have to bring them back to reality if they're going a little too long. I have had that happen a couple times, and then I just learned my lesson. And that's when I decided to just make sure it's always the same policy, no matter how long you've been training with me. And, and sometimes you just got to be the tough guy, right? Yep, because, exactly. you know, it, it, it is a business, so you have to treat it like that. So if it's something you love, you know you have to take care of business, too. So that's what it takes to be a successful personal trainer. Stay with us for tomorrow's stars. Are you in every way, woman? Are you in every way, woman? Every Way Woman celebrates tomorrow's stars fresh from California's funniest female contest representing the East Coast on the West Coast, Ms. Brooklyn. Welcome to the show. Hi. Hi. So rumor has it you're pretty funny. So I hear. So I hear. Yeah. All right, take I'll let it you away. be the judge of that. Okay, deal. Thank you. What's up, everybody? <laughs> So uh, my mom started taking karate lessons. Now she thinks everything is a weapon. I can't take her nowhere. We were in a restaurant the other day. She was drinking her juice, talking about, see this straw? You could kill somebody with this. Get you a dart. 
I'm like, where are you going to get a dart from? She said, keep thinking it's a game. <laughs> we outside, a bird fly by. She like, see this feather? You can mess somebody up with this. For real, this is a dangerous weapon. It ends a sharp. You just, mm, mm, mm. You can mess somebody up. She bugging out. Like, sometimes she'll just run up and grab me like this and be like, what you going to do if somebody grab you like this? Huh? Huh? And I'm like, call you? Can you imagine? I'm just like walking through a dark alley, and some guy just grabs me like, give me your money. And I'm like, mommy. And my mom jumps out like, hey, with a straw. Just runs up on him, starts stabbing him in the face with a feather. I was in CV yesterday, you know, just shopping around. You know what I noticed? They got home tests for everything now. They got pregnancy tests, HIV tests, DNA tests. I saw a home drug test. Now, how does that work? I mean, I'm pretty sure you know if you're on drugs. <laughs> you ain't going to be in a store like, I wonder if I'm a crackhead. <laughs> well, let me just grab one of these, and I'm going to go find out. <laughs> this lady outside of CVS stopped me and was like, excuse me, miss, do you have an extra dollar? Who the hell has extra dollars? <laughs> like, I was in there counting my money, like 19, 20, 21. 21? Oh, hell no. Where does extra dollar come from? I don't even want this one. Here, you want it? I hate when those extra dollars be getting all in my way, making my wallet too tight. I'm broke as hell, man. I ain't got money to just be giving away to people. This homeless guy was outside shaking a cup full of change in my face. I was like, show off. I'm so broke, I window shop at the supermarket. They're like, excuse me, miss, can I help you find something? No, thanks. I'm just looking. I'm so broke when people come over my house, I make the food nasty on purpose so it'll last longer. <laughs> they be eating that stuff mad slow. You ever be so broke you get jealous of people's pets? I be like, that dog probably ate twice today. He ain't even got no job. Living in this nice neighborhood. Stupid dog. All right, let's get serious. Let me just ask you a question real quick. You ever seen a cute little boy, then you realize it's an ugly little girl? <laughs> Woo! That is some freaky stuff. You'll be like, oh, ew. You ever seen an old baby? Look like somebody old Uncle Ernest. People try to say cute stuff about it. They be like, oh, he look like he been here before. <laughs> that old baby, he look like he never left. That baby was so ugly, my mom tried to use him as a weapon. She was like, see this baby? You could blind somebody with this. I'm Brooklyn, that's my time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you're not blinding anyone with anyone's baby. No, all the babies I know are cute. <laughs> What's I don't next? associate with ugly babies. And me neither. What's that. next for you? Um, a lot of things. I do a lot of parodies, so you can check me out on YouTube at Brooklyn Jones Comedy. I just did an Iggy Azalea fancy parody, which is called Lazy. I also did a Beyonce um, Drunken Love parody, which is called Chunky Love. So you can check me out doing parodies and all right. performing all around the city. I'm um, so... Lazy. Lazy. Yeah. You already know. <laughs> Stay tuned for more Every Way Woman when we come back. Thank you so much for being Thank here. Thank you. <laughs> Everyway Woman gives back to the community. Go to everywaywoman.com to find out how you can match our donations of undergarments for needy kids. Thanks for getting to know Everyway Woman. This has been an Everyway Woman production. I'm an everyday woman, 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 in every way, yeah, yeah, I'm living my life, 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 living day by day, yeah, yeah. Are you in every way, woman?